Welcome to Quick Shots, a short format traditional archery podcast, where we introduce you to some of the world's most influential traditional archers, and occasionally, some random dudes. All it takes is faith and trust, and just a little bit of pixie dust. Here we go! What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to Quick Shots. I'm your host, Mick Chambers. In today's episode, we talk with Max, Woodman's Finest on Instagram. This Austrian archer is truly living a lost boy's life. You're not going to want to miss a single minute of this interview. So without further ado, hit it! Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Quick Shots. My name is Mick Chambers. I'm your host. I'm here with Max, the uh, Woodman's Finest on Instagram. Hey, Max, how you doing? I'm doing really well, Mick. Thanks for having me on, man. You look like you're having fun, man. <laughs> yeah. What time is it there? Um, right now, um, I think we're right about around 6 o'clock p.m. Um, this is Austria, so it's like cent- Central European summertime right now. Hey, man, yeah. I've, I've been a big fan of yours. I, I mean, even before the push had you on, and I thought that was an awesome interview, by the way. Just congratulations on that. That was really, really well done. Um Hey, but I know you really well. Um, my listeners may not. Why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction of who you are, what you've been doing, all these crazy things that you do, just amazing things. We, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, where am I going to start? Um, I think uh, I, I've tried to make my Peter Pan syndrome into a, into a way of living or livelihood, something like that, if you could say that. Yeah. Um, yep. I had a pretty regular... Um, youth here in Austria actually it was just like school and then heading to university not exactly knowing what to do did some archaeology graduated um, from um, as a biologist never worked as such because all the while ever since I can remember um, this really 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 young child um, all I was thinking about was fishing and hunting and um, doing archery you know knives blades axes all the fun stuff swords martial arts stuff like that right um and i guess i could never really settle for anything else and um, never really made sense to me um and i had uh, the fortunate situation of a really good support system and so um it allowed me to do a lot of things in that regard um never really stopped doing archery never really stopped being outside um being fascinated with what I was uh, basically picking up as a kid yeah. um, from books and movies and stuff like that, right? Like extremely romanticized view, but it was always just like, you know, Last of the Mohicans and stuff like that it was just like, you know, giving me goosebumps. And and so, yeah, I, you know, with a bunch of really crazy coincidences, I just um, somehow managed mostly because of other people's generosity and um, just coincidences um, to travel around the world, do martial arts all over the place. So I went to Brazil the first time when I was 18, training Capoeira in the favela. Then I was like teaching it here for a while. Started going to Japan. Um, I had a girlfriend there for like 10 years and went to Japan about 17 times in my life from um, just training um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, MMA. Then I got into um, Japanese swordsmanship, which I made part into part of my um, what I'm doing basically. Yeah. Um, was really fortunate to have great teachers there and um, representing a style of Japanese swordsmanship in Europe now. Um, and all the while, I was still like going down the other path of mine, which is like just craft, because with all these movies and all these things I was seeing, um, gear was always this thing that really got me going, right? Yeah. You know, maybe what I'm talking about, like you're watching, for example, Last of the Mohicans or something like that. And like, all you're looking at is just like the knives and the sheets and the, the haversacks and, and the rifles and all of this. And um, I was basically just trying to be super aware. And um, I realized that I have this huge obsession with, with functional lines being very attractive, you know, and, and archery is, of course, boom like a whole realm like that like let's not even get started about the functional beauty of bows and arrows and quivers and and arm guards and all of that stuff right um japan was of course great like that and i got a lot 
so really okay. quick there, so really quick there and that's why that's that traditional archery that's why you know you decided traditional archery or is is that right you know because it's just the beauty and the aesthetic of it yeah um that that's that's a whole story by itself maybe um like just to finish the other thing off i ended up being a traditional craftsman and um when I, people ask me what i'm doing like it's really hard for me to say like i'm self-employed as a traditional craftsman but that's basically what i am um I make, I carve with axe and knife. I teach that online. Um, I, I do leather, leather craft. I make knives. I do online courses in all kinds of different stuff. Um, I have a YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. So I somehow try to make it work that way. Um, yeah, but that's by itself a pretty complex topic. But like, yeah, handmade stuff, um, you know, training in Japan with handmade antique swords and stuff like that. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, like this, yeah, no, absolutely. It's like, Oh my God, like, look at this thing. Um, and yeah, so for me, for the longest time, archery was just like traditional, right? Um, and that's kind of what I talked about on the, the push podcast as well. Um, with, with the years that the perception of that changed for me a lot because I realized as soon as you do it longer than three times, it's actually a tradition. So what traditional archery is has changed for me very much over the years yeah. because I know at some point, you know, 5,000 years ago, Egypt started using composite bows. And at that point, there was for sure some guy who said, that's not traditional. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, and now it's like for us, the most traditional thing there could be, right? So it, it's just really a perception for me. And so I started really like just longbow, self-made wooden cedar arrows, clipped my own feathers, painted my, my arrows. And I have a whole bunch of quivers in the next room there made from deer hide, you know, playing style, split finger, the whole nine yards, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it got me so frustrated the way I was seeing it and like this whole narrow-mindedness I had personally um, and how it had to be and stuff that I nearly hung up the bow and then all with the push and the last three years completely rediscovering archery. Now I shoot everything except for a compound. Um, okay. But I have, a, I have a bear bow. I have an ILF riser in pretty much every length that they make him. Um, yeah. And this is what I'm going to bring on, on my first hunt here. What's lying next to me is a one-piece longbow and a stalker stick bow recurve. So, oh, nice. you know. So, so let's talk a little bit. So you are about to go on a hunt here. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay where, t tell us a little bit about that. Where, where are you going? What are you going to be hunting? And then what's, what's the gear that you're taking with you? I think that'd be interesting. Um, At least I'm interested in that. I, I really want to know. Yeah, I think I think um maybe I'm I'm a good person to talk to about about this because I know that I don't know anything right now. Like the closer it gets to this hunt, the more I'm like, I just don't know anything. Um it's just you're not allowed to bow hunt in Austria. Hunting in Austria, hunting in Europe by itself is a is a completely different story because um, first of all, it's traditionally like a very elitist sport. Um, it's pretty expensive. Usually the hunting, you know, like a hunting license in Europe takes you half a year to complete and a whole lot of money, right? Not like I lived in Canada for a while, you know, like doing canoeing and working with outfitters and being a craftsman and all that. Um, my hunting and gun license took me the same amount of time, which is a weekend, which it takes me in Austria to get a fishing license, you know? Um, and now I'm legally allowed to hunt and buy and sell firearms in Canada. You know, so that's like that's how it is. Just yeah. for people to get a good reference somehow. Um, we are. It's very densely populated here. Um, we have beautiful countryside here in Austria, around everywhere. Like you know, Europe is absolutely gorgeous, but there's a lot of people, and so hunting is something that's more done out of necessity. People don't really have the connection to it. We have wildlife managers who literally get a quota every year of the animals they have to shoot. And that's a single person who has basically a certain area. But for people like me, it is pretty difficult, quite pricey. And in Austria, for example, I can't hunt with a bow at all. So that's why we're going over the border to Hungary where bow hunting is legal. There's a couple places in Europe where that is. And most people actually do require um something like a bow hunting credential you know which i know from people friends of mine in denmark so it's very very different so to start it off 
Um, it is an outfitted hunt. Um, that's as far as I know, like, it's a funny story because after the push podcast, I was actually contacted by a guy I didn't know over WhatsApp who got my, my, my number from, from my website and said, Hey, I listened to a podcast really, really cool. Um, I actually live just 30 minutes from you. Do you want to go hunting to Hungary? I didn't even know that that was actually an option. Yeah. Um, thing. Yeah. And first I was like, ah, that sounds sketchy. <laughs> 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 and now I'm realizing yeah, the guy is um, he's amazing. He's a good friend of mine by now. Um, hunted all over the world. Um, and it is so different from what I perceived it to be um, in preparation and um, in how, how people are yeah, perceiving it here because I've done, of course, in like anticipation of you know, hunting in, in Canada, which I couldn't do this year, of course. Um, I, I listened to everything possible over the last few years, you know, from bear hunting podcasts over everything I could hear, listen to about tuning, um, broadheads, broadhead choices, you know, point on distances, fixed crawls, you know, whatever is possible as far as like bow hunting, right? And being, um, um, being proficient as a bow hunter. So now I'm going on this hunt and all of a sudden it's like, it's all about like how to shoot with clearance of my bloody camouflage suit and how to incorporate gloves into the shooting system and all of that. And all I wanted to do was sitting in this tree, you know, and just do whatever I do usually on the 3D course, but it's completely different story, you know, and really? that is that is for one a very interesting thing. Um, so it's an outfitted hunt. It's anything is pretty much possible. Um, deer, does, um, bucks out of season, um, hawks, European hawks, which is I think as far as I know, a whole different story from from North American hogs, you know, which are pretty much feral um, hogs that at some point in the last 400 years just got out. Um, but we're talking about the prehistoric European nasty hawk thing um that's trying to slice your thighs open they got the big um, tusks or something right yeah the self-sharpening tusks and when we hunt them from the ground in europe we actually need chain mail pants or kevlar pants designed for chainsaws because they they turn on you they get in and then they swing their heads left and right trying to sever the arteries in your thighs and stuff like that so um it's a little bit of a different animal and then red stag is open as well um, I just got a picture of one shot there last week that is absolutely majestic. And in between, we're going to be going for a small game, which is pheasant and rabbits. Um, so it's pretty much a morning sit. Then during the day, we're just going to be stalking small game and or whatever is um, coming up around the fields. Um, and then there's going to be another evening sit, which is right now with the light um, going to be like 7.30ish is when we get out, basically. Or like when we have to come in, that's what when you get come in, when sundown. Um, so yeah. what, uh, what gear, what could, well, tell us what your, your, um, tell us what your weapon is that you're taking. Um, so over the last few years, as you can imagine, as, um, I've just bought way too many bows. Um, and like what I'm taking is basically a combination. Um, I've got a, you know, primary bow and a second, um, uh, or like a backup bow. Um, I bought a, stalker stick bows uh stalker stick bow a few years ago um it is a i don't know if you i hope you can somehow see it yeah um it is a a jackal um 62 inches long um 49 pounds at my draw um, i call it 50. uh it's a static recurve um pretty heavy riser very nice bow um sent it back to to south at some point to flatten the grip because i'm just a big um, proponent of the, you know, lower grip, yeah. The solid archer mechanic style of, you know, shooting a flat grip and getting a nice pressure point in your hand. Yeah. Um, then I'm shooting a Eagle Flight Quiver. Uh, my string is from JS Custom Strings out of Australia. Uh, only got great strings from that guy, so I just kept going. Um, I shoot a fixed crawl, uh, which gets me to um, lollipopping 25 meters. And Eagle Fly Quiver, I said already, I'm shooting, yeah, arrow tuning was a long process because I basically had three different arrow setups that, was, that were fitting on the spoke. Yeah. Um, and I went with the most reliable and best spinning of them with the biggest um, green per inch 
as far as the shaft goes, which is an eastern axis, 400 cut down to 30 inches. Um, I did that not, be actually I love shooting full length arrows for a good point on, but I did that because that's what I had and I wanted to shoot a heavier point weight. Yeah. So I cut them down um, to shoot 265 grains up front, which is a, um, so the setup is basically an, a, a top head 60 grain insert, um, which is an insert outsert. It's not a hit insert, which I prefer. Yeah. Um, it has a short collar on it, which is amazing. The cheapest thing I've ever bought to protect my arrows. And then a 200 grain point. Um, wanted to shoot a 200 grain point because it's just very easy to find good broadheads. So those outside. stainless, those are the stainless insert outserts? Um, those are the stainless ones, 60 grains. Yep. Um, and then very important for me with, with is this the collar. Um, it has absolutely like cut down my broken arrows to pretty much zero, uh, but I wasn't willing to go with something that cost me like three, four bucks, gold tip, whatever. Um, and these, I work with Tophead a lot. Um, it's a German company, as most people probably know. Yeah. I've shot them all my archery career, wood first and now um, carbons for a while. And um, these little calls cost like 60 cents and they're absolutely incredible. I run, um, I run those on my Eastern Access too, those little calls. Right. And they, they, they make them for every single arrow shaft on the market in every spine. Um, very, very small tolerances. Um, and then it was clear for me that I wanted to shoot trad mains or traditional. So, so what's, your, um, I, what's, your, what's your broadhead there you just showed us? Oh, my broadheads. Um, so yeah, as far as broadheads, I also did a lot of testing because I'm taking this really serious right now. Um, and I need to find something that is available-ish in Europe. Um, and I felt like I needed to tune for the heaviest um, animal on the, on the menu, which is for me, the hog. Um, and I needed an air, uh, a broadhead where I felt very confident um, shooting a hog, which, which means I ended up with about 610 grains, um, tuning ever so slightly weak in, in, in case I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit yeah. shorter draw because of a weird position. Yep. Um, as all, and also I'm going to probably put some lighted knocks in the back, which is going to make the arrow a little bit stiffer because they're heavier, yep. right? Because you're adding any weight to the back of the arrow, it's going to get a little bit stiffer. Um, I had several options. Um, first option I was testing um, was actually yeah. this thing here. It's an alien broadhead out of Australia. Mm -hmm. um, very wide cut, um, pretty nasty um, battle axis. This is a 200 grain um, version. I would shoot it if it was a deer hunt, but for a hawk hunt, it's a little bit too wide cut for traditional equipment for me. And that's got, um, a, chisel, that's got a chisel tip. Uh, it's a chisel tip, but it's not that pointy. And like, um, I, I'm not shooting a compound with, I don't know, like 70, 80 pounds, um, with 300 feet per second. So for traditional equipment, um, if it was a bear hunt, if it was a deer hunt, I would probably shoot these, um, very wide cut, um, spin great, absolutely nasty, um, single barrel heads. Um, that was my first option. Then the second thing I went to um, was several different varieties of the grizzly stick. This is the Overkill um, Maasai. Yep. And I was also considering um, shooting a, um, what is it called? Samurai, mm. which is a beautiful head. Um, I have it in my other bow, I think. Um, but my problem with these is, and I've seen that reported, and so I took into consideration that it's actually a aluminum ferrule. So again, talking about possibly shooting hogs, I was like, um, it's a beautiful broadhead. They came so sharp, sharp out of the box. They came stropped. They were absolutely perfect. But I shot them in a block target for a while, and I realized that they started um, not spinning true anymore. Oh, and it was okay. just a block target. Um, it and it didn't enough? have to do with the ferrule bending. And it also didn't have to do with the steel bending because it's nice one and a half millimeters, beautiful steel. The only problem I think is that anything that's a bolt on construction between the blade and the ferrule mm -hmm. just gonna have some tolerances. And I was able to very easily on a cutting board just press it and push it to where it's spun perfectly true again. But getting a result like that from just a block target was something that I did not like too much. Especially um, at that uh, to be honest with you, at that price point, it should not be. It should well, be. as far as the price point goes, um, 
this is actually um, their cheapest models that they they were on sale. I think I paid like forty bucks for three of them. So it's not oh, the forged okay. version. They have a okay. forged version where you pay for the same head um, to one hundred and thirty bucks for three, and this is more like forty bucks for three. Okay. Um, and here we've got the the samurai right next to it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. They are beautiful heads. Um, the samurai is possibly the prettiest product I've ever seen. It is. Um, it's what I really want to shoot. But um, the combination of aluminum with the bolt on construction, um, like I said, if it was bare, if it was steer, even if it was red stag in Europe, which is about half the size of the Wapiti, um, I would shoot these. But the possibility that there's a hog in front of me, I was like, let's just step it up a notch, right? Um, so what I ended up going with is um, this situation here. Um, this is a Cayuga product out of Australia. Um, they're single piece construction. They have a slot in it where you insert the bleeders. And I think um, I measured these things to be about nearly three millimeters thick. Um, wow. So I think it's 0. 0.2 some inches, which is crazy. That's awesome. Um, What's the weight? They are pilot cut. They fly like, uh, they fly really like um, field points, and they've got a very, very um, pronounced single bevel, so they spin inside even a block target um, 90 degrees at least. So I trust these the most um, just because they are single piece construction, they spin great. Um, and yeah, they're 175 grains and then they're about 200 with the bleeder and the o ring. So that's tuning pretty well right now. And um, give, us, give us the name again. Who, who, who are they? It's a, it's a Cayuga. It's called Cayuga, K A um, Y U G A. Cayuga, and this is the pilot cut generation two. Um, they're very economically priced for what they are. And in my opinion, um, they, they're everything that I wanted out of a cutthroat, but I was just not able to get any cutthroats um, anymore at the point where I was shopping for broadheads. Um, and as you can see, the single bevel is extremely wide and well pronounced. It's straight edges, it's easy to sharpen. Um, and they give you the bleeder, non bleeder option with a slot. Yeah, that's nice. Um, <clears throat> and what are you going to run? Those slots or no? You're going to do two blade. I just going to, this is, they also come in 150. This is the 150 here. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, and there's a slot machined into it. So you're inserting the, the bleeder or um, the infill. Um, into that slot and then you put an o-ring on from the back which is pressing it into place yeah um so it gives you a very very indestructible Ooh, combination very cool. Um, very cool on the back it's also pretty important i'm shooting the um the original track veins which is some um, uh, wild fletching um turkey feathers i've got them on pretty much everything uh and i've Tested them in the rain, and I had them in buckets of wait, water. Wait, wait. You said you said two things there. Sorry, maybe I just misunderstood. So you said trad veins, but then you said wild. Yeah, like I call these the original trad veins because this stuff's not getting wet. Um, I had a couple of tests where I put them in a bucket, I put them in the well, and I was stirring them around. I actually posted it on a push group a few times. Um, just stirred it around, got it out, put it back in, stirred it around on the water. Um, nothing changed, and then I just shot it into um, into my hawk target. Um, nothing. They didn't. They flew over the shelf. Uh, they didn't lay down. They didn't. So just are those react th to those all. are those are just treated turkey feathers? They're or not treated turkey feathers. That's the point. That's what people like. What's really like not well known is that turkeys have a, a natural, um, you know, naturally oily feathers. It's not like duck feathers or goose feathers. Um, but they do have a pretty high oil content. So the way that my buddy um, Josh from Wild Fletching is actually doing it, he's taking the wings in from, from turkey hunters. Um, and then he's basically, the hunter can decide which wing they want to be have made into feathers. And he makes them for them. And the other wing he makes into commercial feathers. He used to make all the feathers for Three Rivers Archery, all the, the turkey fletching. Mm -hmm. um, and even when he dyes them, and he dyes them very, very beautifully, um, even when he dyes them, um, they are actually they're super good. First of all, they're incredible. Um, they're the best feathers I've ever had. They're so consistent. 
um, he came up with a whole method to to sand the keels and make everything as consistent as possible. They're not ugly. Um, they're not ugly like those trad veins. No, I I I don't have a problem with trad veins. I have some right here. I, I'm, I know, I, I'm just gonna tell you, man, I am not a trad vein fan. I don't care what you say. Right here. Yeah. Mm. Actually, it's not, it's not as nice as the arrow beside it. I have even a video on, on, on YouTube actually where I'm showing how the, how you actually have to draw um turkey yep. style barge stuff on uh, tread veins because okay. people just put tiger stripes on it and it just looks not so nice. But um there's a way how you can mimic that and from a couple of yards away you can't even tell um that it's not a turkey feather if you put that on the tread veins. And it I've shot those for months and months, but I wanted to go back to um that style of archery. Uh, so I talked to Josh a long time and then I got them in. Um, and like I said, I had them in the rain. Yesterday, I actually made a video um, shooting them uh, in the rain, the entire archery course, 32 animals. Um, just my bow was drenched. Everything was drenched. The, the fletching didn't change in shape or anything. Um, it just had some pearls of water on it. Um, and like I said, I had them submerged in, in wells and stuff, stirring around four, five, six times. Um, and then I just shot them right over my shelf and they wouldn't change shape at all. Hey, so, do, you, do, you build your, do you build your shelf up at all or do you just leather and um, velcro? Yeah, so over the last few years with the push, I've tried pretty much everything, of course, that, that people would talk about. Um, I had built up shelves. I put, built leather shelves yep. um, with, with Velcro on it. Uh, I had uh, bare weather rests with the top cut off with a Velcro set next to them. Um, and what I started doing now is like I'm building my own um fishing rest um or fishing line rest wangard style slightly angled up and forward yeah. um in black just because i don't like this white fishing line stuff on my bow um and i've been shooting this for the last two months it's still the same on it it nearly looks looks new it's just the top ones are slightly fraying but um i can see this holding up for for a year or longer which i've never had with any other rest um you gotta take it was already pretty forgiving with threading do me a favor, take a close up picture of that so that we can, we can put it over here so I can have it over top of this. I'd really love to see that. That, that is really cool, man. If you don't mind. Not, not right now, not right now, but just okay. when you get a chance. And I I'll... could probably screenshot it right now, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure my phone's just gonna crap out. No, no um, I'm, I'm saying like later on, I'll put it on and edit. No worries, but that's really yeah. cool, dude. That's really cool. So that's your well, setup? It's the Vanguard thing, right? Um, Trent Vanguard's, Vanguard's making them, and um, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it has some, you know, some people are shooting them that way, um, yeah. already, but I, I don't think it has caught on as much as it could or should. Um, it's, it's a very easy to make yourself rest, um, and it, it has been extremely forgiving. So, uh, I really like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that is really cool. So, so that is how, the, how's the wear on those, those long uh, versions of, um, of um yeah answer to a very short question. <laughs> that's okay. How how's the wear on those uh, um, uh, wild fletchings? Is it on, off that rest? Are you, are you getting a lot of wear with your practice or? No, no, nothing yeah. at all. Like um, I I make my own fit, my my own arrows, of course, um, and I I just make sure that the keels are nicely glued down on the front. Um, the way that they come from Josh, they're so flawless. Um, like I have nothing actually to report about them that I don't like. Um, and <laughs> like I said, I shot, I shot any type of arrow before True Flight, Gateway, Ozark, the Tread Veins, um, AAE Elite Veins over, you know, my plunger because I have a bunch of posts that are actually ILF, um, metal risers, so I can shoot a, a rest in a plunger. Um, and yeah. They, they just like they fly absolutely incredibly they just look beautiful in flight um that does have a little bit to do with the archer though right so why don't you tell us about your your journey from you know where you started off in in trad archery like in terms of how you, you shot maybe a little while ago and to to what how you're practicing now and how you expect to hunt uh in terms of your process your shot process like What's your shot process that you go through? How how did how how has it evolved? Has it got better? You know, are you are you experiencing target panic? Um, do you shoot three under that sort of thing? 
Yeah, so um, originally I was shooting um, stuff like this. Like this is my actually the second. Um, it's basically the backup bow. And, and this is what I shot for the longest time I had. Um, this one is a Turkey Creek longbow that I bought 10 years ago or longer. Um, they don't make them anymore. Incredibly fast um, reflex, deflex longbow. Um, very light, you know, mass weight, heavy bow. That was what I, what, what I was shooting. Classic. Um, nothing under 50 pounds that was like, oh my God, like, you know, because I was orienting mostly uh, towards the American market because in Europe, archery was just not doing what I wanted it to be. Um, the perception of archery here. Um, it was fun, but like, I just don't like doing things with uh, like where I have a purpose in mind as far as goal. And it just didn't do it for me. Um, so what I was shooting was something like this, Turkey Creek longbow. Um, this is now my backup hunting rig with a different set of arrows and like one of my own quivers that I made. Of. And um, I shot it split finger um, and I shot it uh, some days incredibly well and some days um, I felt like I was holding the string and pulling the bow back, you know, like absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I got tired of that and that's where I actually hung up the bow for maybe one or two years, um, several years back. I just didn't see any way out of that anymore. Uh, still love the bows and stuff, but there was just too many frustrating parts of it. Um, and then I was in Japan actually and um, I probably just being in urban Japan, I got a little bit antsy um, and I just surfed around YouTube um, like so many of us probably that way we found the Push Archery movie. Um, and first of all, it was something that I always wished for, which within a very short amount of time, um, all of these question marks were basically taken care of to a certain um, degree. like you know, tuning the different types of bows and this and that, all the stuff that I knew about already um, by just doing huge amounts of reading and magazine, ab, um, like abos and just research, but there was nothing out there where like really in a crisp, understandable, um, non-pretentious way, someone would just like present all of that to you. And I, that, that really got me hooked on it again, because um, also because of the, the whole, talk about aiming methods, um, you know, all the different stuff that you can do basically with your um, archery iron sights, how I call them, like, you know, either changing the iron sights in the back or changing the iron sights on, on, on the front. Yeah. Um, and I used to be an absolute, like, militantly, I was against all of that. Um, because, you know, it was just like Mongols and Japanese archery and like war bows and all of that kind of stuff was cool and everything else was um geeky and and cheating and stuff um and that that kind of mindset really got me into a corner where i just didn't want to do anything anymore i was just getting too frustrated um and then i out of this frustration basically um or i don't know like the um I don't know, the FU factor, how Joel Turner calls it. I just got so annoyed with it that I, I actually jumped over that um, that threshold, if you will, um, and had a deeper look into that stuff. And then I actually started shooting this bow three under first. Um, and it, it still didn't, it helped me a little bit with my, with my, um, my, my instinctive or like whatever you want to call it, hand-eye coordination shooting. But it didn't help me with the beehive in my head um, and then I kept watching the push and then there was this like um, bare ball masters video where people talked about um, they needed the process in their head that would take their mind off the shot basically. Yeah. And that's, and I think Dwayne Martin said something along those lines. And that's when I was like, that's it. That's it. That's my problem. Like I'm standing there and I'm basically just like um, everything, you know, between heaven and earth is going through my mind while I'm, while I'm shooting a bow, except for, what I'm supposed to think about or not think about. And yeah, and basically that was it. Fixed crawl, um, consumed everything that was ever done by Joel Turner from the Masters of the Bear Bowl 4, I think, where he was on, um, all the way through to every podcast um, with him, um, courses, whatnot, um, solid archery mechanics, roots, every Masters of the Bear Bowl part um, online, five parts. Uh, and then rewatched it and then let it sink in and then watch it all again. 
Um, and what I'm doing now is shooting a fixed crawl um, triggerless after a long time shooting a trigger, like a clicker, limonic clicker. I'm shooting a triggerless, um, extremely conscious cognitive shot um, where still on every single shot, I'm setting my hips, I'm setting my, setting my shoulders, I'm setting my hook, I'm setting my grip. Um, I put my own little parts into shot. Um, so basically from the set to the setup position, I'm putting my shoulders in. Um, recently had a lot of help from um, uh, Canada's only um, Alex Melnick, um, the yeah. true king of Canadian archery. Um, incredible coach, man. super nice guy. Uh, he was on your show as well. I, I, I got to disagree with that, but whatever. Go on. Yeah, like I'm only saying that online. We both know what I really think about Alex Melnick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is, he, is, um, is, he, he really got it like right to it what was my problem um and um so i fixed that and now basically um from setting my shoulders and setup i'm i'm curling into my anchor then um i i get the aim done that i decided on before i was actually drawing the bow okay. um what distance is it usually measured um i'm bringing a range finder which is a new game for me to the hunt um, ranging land marks around me. Yeah. Um, after doing a lot of guessing and checking with the range finder, getting pretty good at um, estimating distances, but I feel like I'm owing the animal at this point that if I can do the ranging, um, that I will do it. So mm -hmm. I range land marks um, and then- now, now um, that's, that's a really good tip. And so we sh let me pause there because I, I think yeah. that so many people who have never hunted before and they want to get out and hunt, um, and then they go hunt and they, they're not successful. They just quit traditional archery altogether because they're not successful. It's good to take a moment and just listen to, to what uh, Max is saying here. He's range finding landmarks. So when you're in your tree stand and you're out there, when an animal moves to that landmark, you know it's 20 meters or you know it's 15 meters or you know it's yeah. 26 meters. And then you can move your gap or your crawl or whatever you, you, you're shooting. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And, or you know you have a max distance that you have to know what that max distance yeah, is. Exactly. That that's exactly it. And like so I'm I was asking about it and I was like until very recently I was like, oh, I'm not, not gonna bring a rangefinder. Um because like the ego inside me was just like um you gotta get done this and that way and blah blah and um, I'm not even getting into the technology talk because um I find it absolutely ridiculous to have um precision turn points and precision made um arrows from carbon and glass on your bow and this and that and then and then i'm just drawing the line here and i'm drawing the line there mm -hmm. i hunt or like i shoot a traditional bow because i love the feeling of the, of having like the looks and and all that but i'm not shooting it because it's more primitive than something else because at that point where am i drawing the line am i going to take the glass of the bow or like the lacquer finish yeah. or like my rest material is velcro like it, it probably doesn't get much more, um, you know, modern and just artificial than Velcro. So for me, like that's never actually really a reason anymore. I completely moved away. This is not even having a part in my entire archery thinking, how much or not technology is in there. So I asked about range finding last time and I got a lot of these answers like, you've got your feet or like, I don't know, this and that. And I'm like, that's all fine. But for me personally, I just wanted to know about range finders because like I'm out there and I know Reinhardt Shavalina is this and that size. So if I'm seeing it out at the range, I know exactly what size it is because I've walked up to the target about 250,000 times in my life. Yeah. So now at different distances, I know what its size it is, but I've got like a boar or like a hog in the woods and I have no idea, actually, unless it's like a piglet yeah. with stripes on it. Yeah. I have no idea what size that thing is. So now it's standing at 25 yards and it's humongous. And I think it's further. Or like it's standing in front at 15 yards and it's very small. Um, and, and you know what I'm trying to say? No, you, so, you're exactly okay. right. Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a fantastic tip for hunters, for people who are new into hunting. Get, exactly. Get, get you, know where landmarks are. And if you exactly. have to, 
even if you have to cheat and you have to stick a stick in the ground, maybe you don't have any landmarks. Maybe it's over absolutely, there. absolutely. But you've got bushes, you've got rocks, you've got like you've got some type of like um, remarkable um, feature around you. And like usually, I would say it's like you know there is exceptions, but usually you've got like three directions, right? Yep. Like you know, left, Good. front, center, um, left, right, and center, and then you go like. In every distance, I know this landmark is my max distance, um, where I'm comfortable, where I'm proficient. And there is 15 yards and there's 25 yards. And anything between 10 and 25 for me is the same gap because of the fixed crawl. Yep. Um, very flat trajectory. Yeah. And anything that's beyond that, I'm either bottom of the belly, point on, or back. And that's it, right? Um, no, it's a great tip. So, so that's that and like um this is something that was actually really reinstilled in me um here in europe with hunters um even traditional hunters because here it, it's not even a question that you bring a rangefinder. Mm -hmm. um so i was lucky to have a friend of mine who who, who borrowed me one um uh, who, who lent me one and um so so that's that um other than that um once i'm back here and i've decided on the distance um and what the side picture is going to look like um, for the hunt and also for 3D. I'm trying to really just, I'm not burning a hole because then I'm just thinking aiming, but I'm deciding what spot on the animal is the one that I'm referencing my point to. I'm not referencing the point to the entire animal, which is a typical mistake I do a lot, but it's more like this is the specific point and I gotta put my arrow tip or my broadhead or my, my, my outsert in a certain like reference to that and the rest of the animal is irrelevant to me as far as aiming so um, tip number two um here that max just just mentioned is that before you pull back your bow and start aiming you pick a spot is that correct max yeah and this is like a typical i think this is a typical thing that that people do who came from pure instinctive or like hand eye coordination what i call it hand eye coordination shooting Yep. Um, it's just this, um, this idea of just pulling back and then just like doing something that feels right. Um, but that is not necessarily always involving a specific step that it, that is pre-draw. Um, I was a terrible, like shot, like, uh, like, you know, machine pistol type shooter, just one and the arrow wasn't even a target yet. And I had the next one already on the boat, mm -hmm. um, just out of frustration and, you know, and all of that, but, but now, so that's a step. I decide that what is my side picture going to look like, um, and once I'm back at my anchor, I'm just putting the arrow that at the side at that side picture, and then I let the subconscious as much as possible just keep that, like Joel Turner calls it, watch it to keep it, because I understand now that once I took my aim and I put the point there, it's not going to get better just because I'm looking harder at it or I'm trying to, you know, keep my bow arm or anything like that um, stiffer. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's not gonna it's not gonna do anything so i'm um, i put in a trust step so i was really at that point where i'm back here and then i'm looking at it and the point's exactly where i wanted it to and then my mind goes like is that right maybe is that right um and so i put a step in where like as soon as my stream blur which is also something i recently involved because of alex melnick um, so actually the, the rear of my, my iron sights are as consistent as my point because I found on first couple of arrows of the day, I'm extremely grouping left, mm -hmm. good height, but always left. Mm -hmm. So he was like, where is your string blur? And I was like, what is a string blur? I knew Ooh. what a string blur was, but I wasn't at the point of using it yet. And he was like, you're not using a string blur. And there was so much, you know, there was just so much disgust in his voice that I actually started using a string blur. So it's, it's in there, I pull back, I'm anchoring, and then like the point in the string blur is something I'm getting done, there's a side picture. Um, and then I have the step where I'm like, this is as good as it gets. I, I'm not gonna find out more about my aim during this process. There's not gonna be a light bulb going up going like, hey, well, I need to put it rather there. No, this is as good as it gets. So there's a step where I'm going like, I gotta trust this aim. And this was really important for me to then leave it and go over to increasing um, the pressure in my bow arm, pushing the bow arm down yep. um, and actually pushing 
my my um my scapula on the draw side around my body into the target if i'm not able to trust this aim and leave it where it is i'm not going to be able to to hop over to the next step and that's what i really realized yeah um if i'm doing that i can shoot trigger lifts because if that's really what i'm, I'm believing in then at that point i'm just going like keep pushing keep pushing keep pushing and i'm getting to this point where my my arm on my hand flies right behind my ear anyways mm -hmm. if not then i'm just submerged in aiming and i just keep looking at it and like crapping my pants until i open my fingers right right it's um, all this and, stuff. yeah no so that's the, fantastic the third step is like Knowing what you're doing is the way past the pa panic, right? Panic is a situation where someone is not trusting it, his or her ability to, to deal with the situation. Just like looking at the word panic, that's exactly what it is. Panic doesn't break out when everybody is like, I exactly know what I got to do. That's not when panic occurs. Panic occurs is when you're questioning your entire life in that situation, yeah. right? So as soon as i'm i realized these points were like okay my rear side's off or my points off and all that and i realized that in this very moment i can't do any better than that aim this is all i know this is all things i know mm -hmm. and then i'm going like i trust this then the panic's gone because then the only thing i have to do um is keep swinging both of my shoulder blades around and towards the target and if i'm doing that hard enough my hands actually just opening and flying behind my ear anyways. I don't have it to be anything, right? So my trigger is my trigger is getting past the panic by trusting myself that this is as good as I can do. Nice. Right? Perfect. Yeah, perfect explanation of your, your shot process. And which I, which I is not, can learn from that. I'm not meaning to say that triggers are not amazing. I am entirely I'm, I'm a huge fan of Joel Turner because the way that he words things, the way he gives us visual and more verbal cues to actually understand what's going on in, our, in ourselves mm -hmm. is beyond anything that we know from anybody else. He can explain the situation in like 25 different ways. So like even I understand that, you know, um, and I've seen him doing it with compound people and I've, I've seen him doing it with pistol shooters. Um, and every single time it just makes so much sense, right? Um, and so I, sh I like shooting clickers and I've shot any type or every type of snappity, bubbly, clickety thing that, that's out there. Um, and I'm not, to, I'm not saying that I'm not a huge supporter of it, but I just found at some point that it would be interesting for me to take this understanding that I had and now just take, put, take it into like one step further where there's nothing clickety like snapping anymore. Um, not because it disturbs me, but just because I thought that I could probably take this, um, take this principle and just put it into my mind. Yeah. It's a pro right. you're, you're, you're following a process, right? I'm, so I'm still following a process that is, um, that is entirely rule ruled by, by control. And if I'm doing this last part of, pushing and pulling, um, it's not pushing and pulling, it's actually pulling my arm down and pulling this shoulder blade around, so it's a lot of pulling happening. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing this right, then um, my release is subconscious because I'm just getting to a physical point where it just can't go anywhere else than just like flying open, if that makes any sense. No, um, it, makes, it makes great sense. And it, again, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing process that you have, and I'm glad you, you've, you've really evolved you're thinking on this. I mean, going from instinctive to, you know, just um, firing tons of arrows down to firing really, really good shots, it sounds like, and, and really, really controlled shots. And you're not, your, your trigger, um, which a lot of people when they have target panic, their trigger is their sight picture. And it sounds like you're, you're moving past your sight picture into your back and then moving towards the target with your, uh, with your scapula. So, I mean, it's perfect archery form. And uh, anyone that hasn't seen Max shoot, uh, he's got a bunch of videos up. You can see him shoot on the push, man. There's the, uh, the push um, group on Facebook or even on his YouTube. Um, just amazing. Yeah, I, I love your form. It looks great. It looks fantastic. For a while, I was like, um, for a while, I was posting pretty much every day on the push. Um, and not because I was so good, but just because I made every mistake in a book. I was running around with a huge bleeding 
hole in my nose up here at the bone for like six months. Everything I owned was just like splashed in blood. Um, I was like hitting every face of my body and like, you know, every part of my face and body that you can imagine um, for, for months, for years. You know, everything was just going sideways. Arrows weren't flying, gaps weren't, weren't like, you know, working. Everything that you can imagine I did wrong, but I just, I wanted to get to this point where I'm just like really feeling like I'm not there. I'm not there yet, man. Like what I was talking about before, this is maybe I can do this 75% of time, maybe 70%, 75% of the time. Yeah. Um, because I don't have a, a mechanoreceptive trigger. If I had a mechanoreceptive trigger, I would still probably make 15 to 20% of the time a mistake because I, I, I have a metal flinch somewhere where I'm just going like, when's my clicker gonna click? And at that point, I, I'm already out of it, right? So I'm not there yet. Like if you talk, talk to, you know, about someone who, who really got this down um, mentally, like, yeah, I, I hate to say it again because um, you're such a douche, but Alex Melnick is the guy to talk to and about. Dude, because we're, we're gonna, we'll bleep out Alex Melnick's name on this. Part. Yeah, we, we're in, in editing. I'm just going to get rid of it. So stop yeah, just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. No, like, but, but in all seriousness, um, that's, in my opinion, someone who, who really also like just shooting so much and so conscious Yep. Um, so much ruled by by cognitive approach. Yep. Um. That that he's just. Um. When I saw Alex me. first time um on on a, on his Instagram, I was just like, yeah, that's that's the form that I want to have. And we, I know he he's beautiful form. Just amazing to look at him when he when he's shooting. And it's I'm not just talking about his butt. I'm actually talking about his form. It's actually really good. Yeah. Like it's it's hard to get past his butt. Um, <laughs> So but, but yeah, you, can I, can I move off him for a second? Just, just talk to you about Winker. We have to. Do you know John Winker? Have you heard of John Winker? Um, I'm John. sure that I've heard of him. I'm, I'm just like a face guy. Like I have, I, 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 I it, it's, some it, days it, I wake okay. up and I don't know what my own name is. So he actually but, just, he just actually won the indoors. Um, sure. He won indoor uh, just last week and he, he's been on the, He's been on the push too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like there was a recent podcast with him. It's a, it's a crazy motorcycle guy. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. He, he, that, was a, that was that was a beautiful podcast. I'm I'm listening to everything that they put out. Um, yeah. It, it's just something I've tried what he was talking about, and I just really know that I'm a different mental mental mentally. I'm a different guy. Yeah, me too. Me too. All I want to say uh, on the Winker front is that I mean he's doing things in a different way. Um, and he's, he's taking that energy and he's building it up, building it up, building it up. Um, as you and I know, as martial artists, especially BJJ guys, um, that doesn't necessarily work in a fight because the more adrenaline you're burning, the quicker you're burning it, uh, the, the quicker you get gassed. Right. And then if you get gassed, the other guy's going to just weather the storm and then come at you. Uh, so, so, I mean, uh, it, it doesn't really work for me or the mentality doesn't work for me, but he really does have a nice uh, shot process as well. Um, and yeah, I just, beautiful. yeah, I, lo I love, I like everything about the podcast, honestly, like, um, it's just that, um, I think as martial artists and I've, I'm, I'm really, I'm like, I used to play American football and, and, and all kinds of stuff. Like I've been doing contact sports all my life from since I was six years old, starting judo and, yeah. Um, I think that I'm, I'm separating between martial arts, combat sports, and tactical systems, but I've done all of them, and every single time it's the same thing. You're really trying to control yourself and actually um, not letting the situation necessarily get you up there. And if you're doing this for such a long time, and then someone comes along and says, like, no, 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 like, just you want to be up there. Um, then I totally get what he's saying and that it works for him. I have no doubt. He's yeah. just like a completely emotionally different person to me when it comes to tackling a challenge. Yes. So I absolutely agree with everything he says, and I'm I'm no point like I'm in no position to say it doesn't work for him at all. I, it's amazing that he tells that to people because there must be a lot of people out there who who really could um, benefit and profit from their own adrenaline right yeah uh, for no, me, it's not that. 
I'm already existing all the time up there in the nervous, in the beehive state. I'm a creative type of guy. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a craftsman. Stuff's going on there all day long. It's insane. And if I'm bringing that into a shot, it's just going to be madness. <laughs> so I need to, I need to then, just, and this is why I do martial arts and this is why I do archery. This is why I do contact sports. Um, it's because it forces me to really be in the moment rather than be in like every direction possible. If that makes any sense, no. you know, if you're in a BJJ fight and like a, a stranger is trying to rip one of your limbs off, you better be very present. Yes. Um, and it's a great, um, I think it's just a great training for my mind. And so is archery. And I need it in my daily life because it does that to me. It forces me to, to, to zone out of all the other crap, basically. Yeah. Um, well, whatever Winker's doing, I mean, I know what he's doing. It sounds like he's trying to give away that advice for free. And I know it works for him because he, he's a champion now and he's beaten a lot, a lot of good people. And I saw him in action at the Bear Bowl camp. He's just a phenomenal. Um, he's a phenomenal talent when it comes to archery in general. Um, and so, yeah, that works for him. I, I like it. Sounds amazing what talking about. Really? Pardon, pardon me? It sounds amazing what he was talking about because he, like what he was talking about is pioneering a completely different approach to the same problem. Yes. And I'm all for that because every person is different. Everybody learns differently. Yes. Um, some people learn better with audio or with visual cues or like reading or whatever it is, or even writing down stuff is not sometimes good for people to learn from. And mm -hmm. if he is bringing a different approach to the same problem to the table, that's going to click for a certain percentage of people. That's just an absolutely great thing. Um, so the more, this is exactly what the push and what, what you're doing and all the other platforms out there, but especially you and the push yeah. and maybe the variable project um, is just giving people different ways to look at the same problem. And like, if they're, you know, over time, at some, at some point it's going to click. One person who's coming on one of these platforms is going to say something that's going to click with someone mm -hmm. who already thought, there's never going to be something that's really working for them. I, I, that's I, completely what we all want. I completely agree. And and I know this podcast is about you, but let me just tell you a related story. I was at the um, um, bare bow boot camp in Ohio and we were talking to um, Dwayne Martin. So Dwayne Martin's one of the mentors and he took me and he said, okay, Mick, you be the first one. And there's like eight guys there. And he's like, okay, we're going to go through my shot process. And I want you to go through my shot process. And of course, my nervous energy is really high. And I'm, I'm standing next to Wayne Martin, who's a, a legend. Um, so he's like, okay, do this, do this, then do this, then do this. When I touch your elbow, you're going to, you're going to um, um, move into your back and then you're going to release the shot and just consciously release the shots fine. And then just be at the target. And I did that probably five times, probably my five best, best shots that whole weekend. Um, and then, so I just changed my mind. It's like exactly what you said. You have to have that process and that process takes everything away from the, the aiming, uh, which is a small part of it. And then you, you're, you're working on something else. The, the, you can't have the, the target uh, picture be your, your, your end game. It has to be a, just a part of the process. Then move on to something else. Trust the float, as they say, and then just, you know, move through your back and then execute. So anyway, just on your point there, that resonated with me. I ended up shooting way better the rest of the week. And I came back home and I'm in my downstairs dojo here. And um, I've been firing, you know, great 18 meters right now. So I'm, I'm improving uh, uh, dramatically. Just, just that little tip that Dwayne gave me. So follow the process. And it was exactly what you said, actually. So, But to, to cut in there, like, is yeah. it, are you done? Sorry, I don't want to cut in. No, go ahead. Please do. So like, like my big thing with how I teach carving and everything else, is not the hows and the what's, yeah. but it's always the why's. Because I feel like if I'm, if someone is going to understand the why and the fundamentals behind something, whatever it may be, like how to carve a spoon with an ax and a knife, yep. um, how to do a th shoulder throw, or how to, you know, to shoot an arrow, it, it, the technique doesn't matter because they're always going to be able to be a creative problem solver if they understand the fundamentals of a certain challenge, right? You're getting to a problem. You're going to be able to be creatively finding um, a solution for that and move past it. While if someone gives you only the what and the how, um, as soon as this technique that they learn is not applying anymore, they're stranded. It's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, you're ending up in a, in like a certain position. You've never been in a tournament. 
Yeah. And you're like, I've never been here. I have no idea how to get out of this. If you're only like studying the techniques and being really good with studying the small stuff, like your vocabulary. But you, if you know the grammar, I love finding new analogies while I'm talking. Um, sorry, yeah. just tuning your <laughs> own horn too much right now. Yeah. But this is exactly what it is. Like you have the vocabulary and it's great, but if you don't have the grammar, you know, if you don't have the fundamental yeah. understanding of the language, you're not gonna, you know what I mean? Like it's gonna help you very, very far, but like at some point you're gonna get stuck. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what I've learned with fighting is like, you're going to get always into situations you've never seen. And then you're panicking. Why are you panicking? Because you don't know the answer to the question. That's right. And so the fundamentals of the whys um, you do a certain thing is getting you such a good idea of all the basics and fundamentals and positioning and all that, that you can actually get out of that situation creatively, although you've never been in it. So what happened for you, I think with Wayne Martin was that, you didn't think about the aiming because there was a coach talking to you while you were doing it. Mm -hmm. So now like the challenge is that you're your own coach in every single shot. Yeah. So there's going to be an authority in your head that is not the subconscious. That's basically another way of saying what Joel Turner is teaching all of us is the subconscious is like little screaming thing. Um, if you listen to that one, stuff's just going to go either well or not well and you don't know why and you don't have control over it but if you have this coach in your head that's an authority that it's like standing higher than this like frenetic frenetically screaming subconscious that you're trusting more let it be Dwayne Martin for you there is your Dwayne Martin in your head that you're trusting more than all the other people screaming at you great right great. and you're yeah. going to go <laughs> along with him because you trust him about that so Absolutely. now the challenge is in every single shot, you're going to have this authority, that role model, that idol in your head that is just standing as far as authority and power goes above your, 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 you know, your hysterically yeah, you're, you're, yelling subconscious. 100% correct. 100% correct. It's just a different way of saying what Joel Turner says, but like your story was amazing because it's exactly why you felt so confident and good in these shots is because you trusted Dwayne Martin to tell you exactly what you needed in that situation. And when you're shooting before the door at home, you're not trusting yourself that you actually, that you're actually in charge of that situation. Yeah. I right? love, yeah, no, you're right. And then actually I, I posted something on Instagram where I was like talking through the process, his process, I was explaining what he taught me. And I was like, and I noticed, I'm like, I drove, drove back and got, got to 11, then checked string blur, then checked uh, back tension then um, went back to 11 and follow through. And, and they were very basic commands, right? But I'm talking to the camera as I'm doing this. And I realized, oh my God, those are better shots than I've shot all day today. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I'm actually coaching myself. So that's a good point. Hey, um, what, I, I do want to save some time. I, I do want to talk a little bit, although we've touched, we've peppered in a little bit of your martial arts background because you're such an interesting dude. I mean, archery is great. And, and, and I love that you're doing so much with archery, but we've got to get to um, carving, man, because that's, that's, that's bread and butter. That thing is that you are fantastic. And you mentioned it already, creative soul. Um, but uh, some of the carvings that you do, dude, phenomenal. I'm sure that your, your leather work and all that other stuff is great too. But um, uh, just I've seen a lot of the carving that you've done, the wood carving. So can we talk a little bit about that and how you got into that and just you know briefly go Absolutely. over that? Because I think it's fantastic. The, the viewers need to know that. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, like, uh, the way I got into it was, uh, I think I got just, like, frustrated and tired of having, like, a fascination for blades and tools and just not being able to use them. I just didn't want to become one of those people who has all that stuff at home just resting on a shelf and, like, constantly looking at them with this weird, bittersweet feeling of them being so well cho chosen and well made and well designed but they never really actually get to do what they're designed for yeah. and so i was just looking around and i somehow i just stumbled like over 10 years ago i stumbled on a couple of videos a couple of pictures existing at the time about spoon carving green wood spoon carving with an axe and a knife mm -hmm. um and yeah um the rest is just blur because it's just what i you know what i what i what i always kind of felt like uh i wanted to make things i'm lazy i'm extremely i'm a lazy perfectionist which is um the the, the tragedy of my life 
<laughs> but um, <laughs> basically, I wanted to be able to make functional things that are meaningful for people's daily lives, um, reinstilling. And that's why, like, Woodsman's Finest is basically the attempt to, um, to reinstill people's trust in investing into things for life, you know, or like at least for being a companion along the journey, aging with you, telling your story. That's why I love making leather belts and stuff like that, because I just feel like nothing tells your story like that handmade belt where you know exactly the guy where you bought it from and the talk you had with him at that craft show. And then you're taking it on journeys around the world and it's been on you literally supporting you and holding your pants up, you know, mm -hmm. as you're, you know, losing your girlfriend and then like finding a new job and then having a baby and all of that kind of stuff. Right. And I got to the point during my travels as well, where I just realized I would say sorry to a backpack that I'm leaving at home, mm -hmm. taking another one because it just has been with me for such a long time and, and has help me doing you know, all these things yeah. you know like my boots my pants my 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 knives they're all are different um they're all different experts in different fields and i bring them and i cherish them and then i leave them behind and i'm like sorry buddy today it's like you know i do this i'm gonna bring something else and i wanted to do that myself you know so i built knives and i i built axes and i forged some stuff and then i started manufacturing but i still kept traveling around and just learning as much as I can, going to Japan, looking at Treen there, going to North America, to Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, for example, yep. um, helping building birch bark canoes. Um, I built a lot of hand carved, um, with axe and knife, literally carved paddles in Northern Ontario that people took on 100 kilometer long canoe journeys and stuff like that, you know? And I just wanted to be right there, part of people's story, um, and reinstilling their trust in you can have something for such a long time. You can care for it. You, um, you know, you might have spent half whatever your months pay, not that, but like you know how it used to be. You know, a new pair of boots, a new pair of shoes was a month's pay. Yeah. But then you had them and you dried. You you let them dry when they got wet, and you you wax them and you oil them and and you condition them and then you resold them after five years. And then there you go, 25 years later, you're looking at them and you're going like, and we have been a lot of places together, you know, yeah. and that's exactly. Well, that's I kind of, I that's kind of what it comes across. I, I just want to be honest with you. When, when people look at what you're doing, your stuff, you are sort of living that life that, that I think a lot of people, that's why, that's why I think you have a lot of followers. That's why I think a lot of people resonate with you because they actually wish they were you, you know, they're like, I, I they want to have the adventure. We talk about it in daily life. All our, all our, all of us talk about is it. like, you know, are you just working to live or living to work or, you know, what's that, you know, you, is what's money for? Is it for, you know, making sure that you're wealthy and, you know, you can tell people that you got a big house or a big car, or is it about adventures? And most of us, most yeah. people would, most people would, would, would flat out say, oh man, it's about adventures. You know, I want to get some money so yeah. I can go on adventures. Yeah. But, then, but then, yeah, you're driving a dude, you're driving a BMW. Why would you spend that kind of money on a car? Oh man, like this, you know, so, this is, this is something I've been thinking about so much of the last like, I don't know many, how, you, how many years. I mean, some people say money comes back, time doesn't, right? Yes. Um, and a lot of people want to do certain things. It's easy for me. I'm in such a privileged situation. Like, for, from my situation to talk about this is, I almost don't dare to because I'm just not the right person in, in a way. But I, nothing, none of that was planned. I wasn't like 17 years old and go like, this is what my life's going to look like. No, I had a lot of time where I was just going the classic path. I had like English and Latin and classic Greek in school. And I went to university for seven years and this and that. And like, I was just like, never like this. And then I had an opportunity to leave everything behind, cancel my apartment and like work on a ranch in Northern British Columbia in a place that I've never seen the people I've never met. And I just did it, you know? And, yeah. and, um, and I, I've done a lot of stuff like that just because I have this drive and but I was alone, I was just young, like there was nothing to lose in a way, so I'm not really the right person, but the only thing I'm trying to really share on my Instagram as far as that goes is time doesn't come back, and 
And I've seen far too many people getting sick from, from, from stress and mortgages and pressure and like social pressure and the way you have to live your life and the way you have to have a partnership and the way you raise your kids. And like, you need a house and a cottage and two cars and a boat and a ski do and like, um, and this and that. And like, I've never had any of these things and like, I've never missed them. But yeah. then again, I, you know, I have of course family around Austria with, where you know they have a house and like if I'm just swinging back into Austria for like three or four or five months I'm like can I crash here or like can I crash in that sofa and I had years and years where I was crashing on in cars and sofas and um, at home again you know but I I just didn't feel too ashamed about it because I just felt like you know this is just part of like all of what I'm doing and there's nobody really that I have to that I have to um, explain it to or like justify it to like it's only me yeah at the end of my life like nobody's gonna ask me i'm not gonna ask myself like how many times i still i had to crawl back home after like a crazy six months in the bush or something and my whole family is like hey we're here to 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 help with whatever and i'm i'm the, the most fortunate person that, that that's the case you know um i could do none of the things that i've done would have been possible without people who who saw that and wanted to help me with it. Yeah. You know, none of it, it's just me. It's yeah. always just people who are kind enough to, to let me live that thing. And then I'm trying to, to throw it back out there um, by just showing that it, it is possible. You, you can step on, a, on an airplane and go a place and do a 10 day canoe trip with, with, with bears and, and moose and fly fish for virgin brook trout and it's gonna cost you less than spending two weeks in some resort somewhere where you're just coming back as empty as frustrated as um as you left <clears throat> that's ex that's at least true for me it's not true for everybody but it's true for me and for a lot of people that i've talked to um so i i just tell anybody or everybody don't be afraid to do it like whatever it is you want to para like parachute or you want to you want to like climb a mountain or you want to like do a canoe trip or you want to go on a hunt or you want to learn scuba diving or you want to learn a language just do it right now like today like it's it's fine it's okay you know well my friend um i i think uh you give yourself a, not enough credit and and we all make our own fortune right so uh, and you're you're a fortunate fellow to ha be able to get on these adventures and i appreciate you talking to me today and i appreciate you talking to us and so if People who have made it this far on this podcast, please don't forget to like and share or subscribe. This guy is fantastic. Uh, I, I guess we'll have you on again because we're only halfway through of what I wanted to talk to you about. So I really Dude, appreciate I would love to come back. I would love to come back. Um, That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, at that point, I want to say thank you. Um, I, I think that you're doing some pre something pretty cool here where you're just not like talking about a topic like, like a fitness guy who looks already completely ripped and chiseled uh, where you're like – having this huge difficulty to re like refer to basically as a beginner or like an archer but you're just like hey i'm kind of new to this here um this is pretty cool and i don't really always know what i'm talking about it's just like me yeah um but like i'm gonna do this now and maybe you just want to tag along and we learn together and i think this is something really rare like not really existing in in this entire community so um i wish you the best man i hope this is blowing up as much as it deserves to Thank you very much. Wow, man. I really appreciate that endorsement. That is fantastic. I, I love it. Hey, where can people find you? Uh, where's the best place to, 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 to see what you do and even maybe message you if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm online pretty much all the time, which is the paradox thing about being a traditional craftsman and spending 50% of my time on my phone. But um, um, you can find me pretty much under everything that's Woodsman's Finest, Woodsman's Finest on YouTube um it's mostly carving i hope there's going to be a lot more traditional archery stuff coming soon cool. um most biggest platform for me is instagram for sure okay. um woodsman's underscore finest if you if you miss one of the s's you're going to find a um a company making wood oil so be, be aware of that so it's woodsman's finest woodsman's underscore finest uh woodsman's finest.com is where i'm selling stuff when I have it. Um, there's some pre-order stuff. There's a lot of tools that I've been designing over the last three years that I manufactured with my partner. Um, so yeah, it's all things 
spoon carving, outdoor. Um, you can also find me on Boon TV, which is my online course platform. And right now, actually, there is like a back to school 2020 special. So for like one euro, you get, um, I think, 34 hours of courses wow. for the first month. So wow. like you spend a euro and um, no matter if it's sharpening, hook knives, straight blades, which is directly translatable to broadhead sharpening on a budget, um, um, getting broadheads to a degree of sharpness that you know from wood carving. So it's, I think, um, really a cool course for people who want to get into broadhead sharpening. Um, so yeah, there's 34 hours of courses right now for Europe, Boon TV forward slash Woodsman's Finest. You find it there too, you find it on my Instagram. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Go go check that stuff out. I mean, honestly, this guy, I mean, uh, Max, you're fantastic. Anyway, um, take care, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Everyone, please, please, please be safe, and we'll uh, see you next time. Take care. Cheers.